You know, India has been in the news lately, especially in relationship to Russia. Russia, India, Pakistan, Iran, Syria, and China are all going to be trading in their own currencies. China, Russia, and these others are talking about a new world order, a multipolar world that respects the sovereignty and the security and the equality of every country on the planet. Now, when I thought of India, I really didn't know much about India. I think everything I learned about India came from the movie Gandhi. And probably most Americans understand and think about India in terms of Gandhi. And then about 10 years ago, Slumdog Millionaire. My guest tonight is a native born Indian from India, Pornima Wa. Pornima, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Regis. It's lovely to talk to you as always. Well, I'm so happy to have you as a guest because when I met you a short while ago, um, you really, you blew me away with your background, with your insight, and with how well you articulated so many issues. So let's start off tonight <clears throat> asking you about India. Is the India that most of us knew and learned about through Gandhi and Slumdog Millionaire accurate? Uh, I think the short answer is no. <laughs> um, would you like me to elaborate why? Well, or? yes, yes. I mean, um, Gandhi, he's considered to be like Jesus, a, a nonviolent, uh, peaceful protester. Well, I think... I think what we're all finding out that, that that's inclusive of myself is that um, I went to a private British school in India and the history books are textbooks. Um, and this was a very, you know, it was an excellent school. Uh, I learned Sanskrit there and, uh, you know, uh, classical literature. It was, it, was, it was a fantastic school. However, we were indoctrinated with nonsense. <clears throat> the entire history of India from antiquity, from ancient times to probably the eighth century, maybe the ninth century is fairly accurate. Everything after the eighth and ninth centuries to the present day is complete nonsense. It's just, and that includes everything, the geopolitical history, um, you know, the, uh, the other history, um, and that includes Gandhi. Um, the, the British, when they came to India, uh, they colonized India for many centuries. I think they came to India in the 15th or 16th centuries. Uh, the East India Company was formed in 1600 in a place called Surat, which is north of Mumbai or what I used, what, what was called Bombay. And um, the, the British were fairly, you know, they were fairly wicked and very cunning and sly. They were traitors. They were like, they're essentially like the Khazarians, very good at what they did. They were very cunning and sly and excellent at trading and commerce. And they had a policy of what is called um, divide and conquer. And they did that effectively all over the planet. And India was one of the first places, the test run, the beta run for that policy was India. India was one of their oldest colonies, believe it or not. And when they came to India, the, the Mughals or the Mongols, when they came into Mughals, they changed their names and they were called the Mughal Empire. The Mughals essentially established their, uh, the, their Sultanate from the 1500s all the way through the 1800s. And the British, when they took over, first they came in as traders and then they just took over the country. I think by 1857, they consolidated the entire country. And we had a freedom movement 
when the British were there. And Mahatma Gandhi, as he's called, I'm not going to call him Mahatma, I'm just going to call him by his name, which is Mohandas Gandhi. Mohandas Gandhi came from Durban, South Africa. He actually worked and fought wars with the British. He was in the British Army in South Africa. He, people don't know much about him there, but there's a book called The South African Gandhi. This is important. It was, it's written by two South Africans and it gives you the real history of who Gandhi truly is. He was a British toady and a British agent. There was, he, he was not pro-India, he was pro-British. And they paired, the British parachuted Gandhi from South Africa after he became a barrister or what they call a, a, a lawyer, but in, in the, the Brits call, call them barristers. Um, he was British educated barrister and they brought him into India. Now, nobody really knows where did the money come from? Um, he was living very well in South Africa. He had a huge ranch. He had a lot of workers and laborers on his ranch. And when he came to India, he already had his, um, um, you know, he was set up. And when he came in to India, he was suddenly catapulted into, um, you know, all sorts of positions into what is called the Congress Party. And the Congress Party was not even formed by Indians. It was formed by Alan Hume, who was a Brit. He was a British guy. And it was supposedly the party that was our freedom movement party. So all the people in it were supposed to be freedom fighters. Uh, well, Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, who was our first selected prime minister, was part of the Congress party. And everything Gandhi did was anti-India. Um, every nonviolent movement, every little uh, statement he made, people thought he was pro-India, but he wasn't. And now we're finding out more and more from uh, books, from authors, uh, from diaries, from his assistants who were with him. You know, we're getting a lot of notes. All the, the real Gandhi is now coming out. And information was there about Gandhi. It just was suppressed for 70 years. And when Narendra Modi got into power, who's a nationalist, in 2014, all this information about Gandhi and Nehru and all these anti-Indian so-called leaders came out. And the movie Gandhi was made by Richard Attenborough, who is a, he's a Brit, he's an elitist, and it is complete propaganda. It's complete nonsense. Wow. Um, you, you also told me that Nehru was really a British asset. Uh, tell me about that and and how he and Nehru, uh, 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 tell me about how Nehru and Gandhi ended up splitting off Pakistan from India. I had no idea about that. Well, neither did most of Indians. And then we figured it out. Um, Nehru was Cambridge educated. He went to the University of Cambridge. He was an elitist. He came from a very wealthy Indian family a Brahmin Indian family. Um, and uh, he was very, uh, very close to the Brits. He considered himself a British man. He did not consider himself an Indian. He was extremely elitist. Uh, and he, um, he, he considered Indians to be fairly downtrodden and uneducated, the, the regular Indian, somebody like me, for example. Um, he, he had nothing good to say about Indians. He didn't like the, the country of India. And um, Gandhi, again, was also British educated. Um, he was a barrister, and so was Nehru. Nehru was educated as a barrister in, uh, in, at the University of Cambridge. And he came, when he came back, he fought for the British. He said he fought on behalf of the Indians but he literally fought on behalf of the, the British. Everything was done beh behind closed doors. And he became part of the Congress party and they came together and they pretended you know, to, to put them behind bars. But Nehru and Gandhi were put behind bars in these palaces. I mean, they were actually put under house arrest in palaces. And other regular freedom fighters in India, there were many, one of them was Veer Savarkar. And you know, I'm not gonna name a lot of names, but you know, your audience might not know these people because they've never been mentioned um, anywhere. 
except maybe in a few history books in India. But these people were sent to Andaman and Nicobar, which were these far out, far, they were literally like Alcatraz on an island uh, where there were snakes and insects. I mean, it was awful. So the real fi freedom fighters were killed and tortured and Gandhi and Nehru were put in, in palaces under house arrest. And it was called jailing them or imprisoning them or something. Now, fast forward um, into the 20s and 30s, we had a movement, uh, you know, that took place to accelerate the, the whole process of independence from the British Empire, uh, because India was under the British rule for, you know, since 1857, but in reality, the British were in India since 1600. Um, and Nehru and Gandhi essentially uh, delayed Indian independence by almost 30 years. We got independence on the 15th of August, 1947. We should have gotten our independence in the early 1900s. And that just didn't happen because the First World War happened and the British you know, so, you know got all the Indian uh, cannon fodder to go fight in the First World War. And then they did that in the Second World War. And that was partly because of uh, losers like Mahatma Gandhi, well, Mohandas Gandhi, I'm not gonna call him Mahatma because he's not a Mahatma, uh, which means great soul in Sanskrit. Uh, Mohandas Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru essentially made sure that India never got independence, that we were always under the, uh, the, the, the British uh, boot. And then, you had another character by the name of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. He was a Muslim and he was Cambridge educated and he was a barrister. So this was essentially a club of the elite running the whole show with the British. And then the last Viceroy of India was um, Louis Mountbatten, uh, Prince Philip who just died last year, his uncle. He was essentially Windsor Mountbatten, but he was called Mountbatten. And he had a wife, um, his, her name was Edwina Mountbatten. She was a Khazarian, she was a Rothschild, um, Ashkenazi Jew. They're not really Jews, they're Khazarians. And it was an open marriage between Mountbatten and Edwina Mountbatten. And she was his beard. I think your audience knows what a beard is. I mean, she was just, it was a sham marriage. It was an open marriage. She was having uh, all sorts of um, affairs. And Mountbatten was essentially homosexual and he liked little boys. And Mountbatten was giving, Louis Mountbatten was helping Edwina, giving her all the little ins and outs of uh, what needs to happen with British India. And she was essentially feeding all that information to Nehru because she was having an affair with him. And Nehru did exactly what Mountbatten wanted him to do. And one of the things that the Brits wanted to do after World War II. After World War II, the empire, the British empire was just bankrupt, it was spent. There was no more money to extract from, it, from India. India was, they took $50 trillion, they looted India over 70, I think uh, over 100, 100 years, it was 70, uh, I'm sorry, $50 trillion worth of loot was taken out of India in today's dollars. $50 trillion, let me repeat that was looted out of India into the British Empire. By 1947, Britain didn't need India. India was completely destitute. Um, it was done. It had the lowest GDP um, ever uh, from it, it, India having a GDP of almost 35% of the planet in the early 1700s. It was one third of the world's GDP. To 1947, we were an extremely impoverished destitute country, thanks to the British. And of course the others like the French, the Portuguese and the Dutch and all these other colonialists, but the British really give, you know, essentially put the final nail in India's coffin. And they didn't even need India anymore. So it was time to essentially split India from the British empire. And then you had these toadies uh, you know, and British agents like Ma uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Gandhi and Nehru who were pretending to work for India. Now, Jinnah and uh, Nehru were, had ambitions of becoming the first prime minister of India. Well, you can only have one prime minister. And the British wanted to split India into Pakistan and India so that India never really rises in power. And they always have this thorn in their side, which is Pakistan. 
to always, you know, do all sorts of incursions and problems. And so that was the plan because the British wanted to do that again, divide and conquer. And then they wanted to run off into the Middle East because they had oil. Um, they had oil they had to worry about. Massive amounts of oil. The, the British were, um, you know, after oil um, in Arabia and Iran um, and other places, as you know. And so they decided to drop India, but they wanted to split India. And the Indians, the people in India did not want the split. They were very much for India being one nation. And there was one particular patriot, his name was Nathuram Godse. He's the one who assassinated Gandhi in 1948 after the split, well, the split happened between Pakistan and India in 1948. And it was absolutely genocidal. Millions, I think a good 10 million Indians died on both sides uh, because people were massacred on trains that were going back and forth because the split actually went through the uh, province of the Punjab. And it split Punjab, the families, you, just like Ukraine, uh, the, the present uh, day problem, you know, you had part of the population on, you know, part of the family on the Pakistani side and part of the family on the Indian side, it was horrific. And it's, it's like that to this day. So a lot of the people got panicky and they started flooding India from, you know, Pakistan because they didn't want to live there. And Pakistan is primarily Muslim. Uh, but that doesn't really matter because a lot of Hindus from Pakistan left and came into India. So it became a Muslim state. It wasn't a Muslim state, but it became one. And um, nobody else in the Congress party, the other patriots, there were about 12 of them, they did not want the partition. Nehru and Gandhi essentially engineered the partition with the help of the British. Um, and Gandhi, in my opinion, should not be called the father of India. He should be called the father of Pakistan because he's the founding father of Pakistan. He's the reason we have Pakistan today. And then Nehru essentially, they selected Nehru, uh, the British did, brought him in. He became the first prime minister of India and uh, India just went down the slippery slide into oblivion. Um, it was a disaster. And um, India has never been the same for the last 75 years. Wow. Um, and then uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who was suffering from cancer and tuberculosis, he ended up becoming the first prime minister of uh, Pakistan. So they got what they wanted. And India essentially just went uh, down the tubes. I, I hope that helps. But... Well, it's, it's a very condensed history lesson, but very good. Um, you and I have also talked about the very, very long-standing relationship between India and Russia. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I'm just finding out more and more about the, the, the centuries-old history uh, between Russia and, uh, and India. And I, I try to go as far back as possible. When I look at the Sanskrit language and I'm fairly fluent, I have very good working knowledge of the language, which is the ancient Indian language. It is the progenitor of all the Indian languages. Um, it's not spoken anymore. We need to start speaking it again. Uh, but the grammar of Sanskrit, the, a lot of the vocabulary, the declensions, conjugations, et cetera, are uncannily similar to Russian. In fact, the Russian uh, grammar is probably 95% similar to Sanskrit. It's the only quote unquote European language that's that similar. The words are very similar as well. Um, and I find it fascinating that one of the Sanskrit scholars who went on his, he, I think he went to a trip to Russia to Tashkent with one of the prime ministers in the 1950s he understood Russian so well that he did not need the translations. I mean, he, because he was a Sanskrit scholar and he asked the woman who was translating from Russian into English, he said, hey, you know, you don't need to translate. I, I understand what, what's being said. And to me, that's mind boggling that he understood what was being said in Russian and he was not a Russian speaker. So that says a lot there that the, the, when languages are that similar, there's a lot of similarities between the two peoples. And 
it explains why the two peoples of Russia and India are so close. This is not a coincidence. I, I think there are reasons behind it. Then fast forward to the 1400s, I think probably the 1440s or 1450s. I think I mentioned there was a, a, a traveler by the name of uh, Afanasi Nikitin. He left from Tver and St. Petersburg and he started his way through Iran, he came down uh, to Iran and from Iran, he came into India, he was Russian. And he was the first European to ever step foot in India in 1469. 30 years before Vasco da Gama, who was supposedly the first Portuguese European to come into India in 1498. So our history, again, like I said, is corrupted. You know, we, we got to go back and re really reshuffle history from the eighth century on. And then after Nikitin came in, he stayed, I think, for several years, traveled all over India and um, became literally uh, friends with many Indians. And then apparently there was a major trade association of, of traders that went to St. Petersburg when Peter the Great was in power in the 1700s. So after Nikitin came back, there was this void. And I don't believe that. I think that's all nonsense. It was a void of 200 years uh, between India and Russia, the connections. And I just don't see how there would be a void because once you make connections, you make connections. You just don't let it go. Um, but the next big connection came in the 1700s. A lot of traders went to St. Petersburg and uh, the Tsar, Peter the Great, gave them concessions on trading. They could trade freely in St. Petersburg and other part of, parts of Russia and travel and bring their goods, buy goods. And so the, this, this relationship has been very, very old. Um, it has been centuries long. This is not just 70 or 75 years old. This is centuries. It's, it's a very deep relationship between the two countries. And I think we need to study it in depth. We really need to find 